usually as a couple are getting to know each other, they're on their best behaviour. And they might dress better than they normally would dress. They maybe behave better than they would normally behave. Maybe being kinder than they would normally be. More considerate of the other person than they would normally be. But you don't get to know what this person is really like till after we're married and settled. And maybe not even for a couple of years after that. Until finally one or both of the couple are, get too exhausted keeping up their pretense so that they drop it. And start to allow their real character and personalities to come through which can be a rude awakening for the other person. So effectively, initially, we each present a glamorous version of ourselves to the other person. And they are doing that to us. So we get a distorted idea, a glamorized idea about what it's going to be like to be in a relationship with this person. Then the idea of marriage can have all sorts of layers of glamorous illusion around it. And even if we do manage to marry the person of our dreams, we eventually face the disillusionment of dealing with the mundane facts of everyday life. Paying the bills, earning money, dealing with the problems of daily life. We might be tempted to ask ourselves, well, if this is my dream come true, why am I not happy? I'm now supposed to be happy and I'm not happy. Is this the wrong person? Am I with the wrong person? Did I marry the wrong person? Have they changed in some way? Were they pretending to be somebody else? Well, possibly they were because we were pretending to be somebody else, more than likely. In addition, society itself often glamorizes romantic love. All the happy ever after stories, all of the, the songs, having words like, I'll never love another. Well, what kind of view is that? Does that make any sense? Isn't that kind of a selfish stance for somebody to offer that and to somebody else to expect it? It's a very closed-hearted way of life. Anything that's closed-hearted limits love and person's capacity to love is asking for trouble because sooner or later their inner guide will step in and want them to expand their capacity to love and to develop their capacity to love to include others. And that's why I don't usually use the term unconditional love to describe this enlightened love because this enlightened love is also much more universal. It tends to want to broaden out and include other people, other people beyond our immediate circle. That's the nature of it. So an exclusive us two against the world doesn't really work well for this kind of love because it's a broadening outward, just like romantic love initially broadens our outlook and gets us outside of our shell and showing care for another person. The next step is that love wants to include a lot more other people, initially within the circle of our family, but then beyond that and to include more people and more aspects of life. That's the nature of that love. So basing a relationship on a love that's exclusive and is not inclusive is sooner or later asking for trouble. That doesn't mean we can't have a primary relationship with one specific person because there's all sorts of financial ties and other issues to do with having a primary relationship with somebody. It's the nature of life that we feel a deep love for other people but we don't have to follow through on it if we have a stable relationship with somebody and then we see somebody else and feel this deep love for them. It doesn't mean that we're with the wrong person. It may just be an infatuation. It may be a genuine love, but it doesn't mean we need to do anything about it. We can acknowledge it for what it is. We can be very tempted in the excitement of that new love to begin to diminish in our minds the love we already have. And maybe we need to move to that new one, but maybe not. Because we're experiencing the glamour of that new relationship, whereas the glamour in the current relationship has diminished and we're getting more real about it, but it's also becoming more genuine. Whereas the new one... The new love has a lot more glamour around it and we don't know what's really genuine about it. We don't know how much we've made up and what's really real. Again, we're only seeing the best in that person. We're not looking at the downside. We're only seeing the upside. And in a current relationship, we're only seeing the downside and not seeing the upside. So on the one hand, we need to be open to loving other people, but not necessarily doing anything about it other than just enjoying the feelings of it and being careful to limit the ways that we express that love. And society also strengthens and supports this idea of romantic love 
and building lots of glamour around it. There's many businesses rely on glamorising romantic love and marriage. It's a huge industry feeding the glamorous illusions around romantic love, which if we buy into them, will distort our perspective and stop us seeing the real value of romantic love. And the way of enabling us to learn to love another person, helping to connect with our inner guide and to live out from the highest and best within us, instead romantic love becomes this distorted thing, this odd thing in its own right, which gets disconnected from the rest of life and becomes something exclusive and only about us as a couple and us as a family and nothing to do the rest of life. See, one way of looking at romantic love is to simply see it as part of our path in learning about love and learning to love another person. All the glitz and glamour are not what it's really about. It's really about learning to love another person in this moment and looking for ways that we can express that that works within the society in which we live. It's not necessarily true that this person we love is going to be the only love of our life because for the most part they're not the only love of our life. If we try and make them the only love of our life more often than not the statistics show in terms of broken relationships and broken marriages that it actually doesn't really work very well to do that. Now social constraints and our own personal preferences can result in us having a very specific form of committed relationship with that particular person and there's nothing wrong with that. We still need to be aware of that. Sooner or later, we may find ourselves needing and wanting to love other people. But as I was saying earlier, to do so in another form and not automatically assume that we need to ditch the one we've got and get somebody else because they just seem more exciting. And not necessarily ditching the relationship we have because it didn't live up to the romantic illusion of happy ever after. There is no happy ever after in that shape. The happy ever after comes from deepening into our capacity to love, not in trying to create an exclusive love with one specific person. We can keep the exclusivity in the social level, but not on the level of love. Love by nature is universal and reaches out to expand itself. Rather than looking for the one and only version of love, we need to look for this universal love of loving more and more people. We need to get used to loving lots of people. The world needs us to do that. The health of society needs us to do that. And romantic love can be a wonderful vehicle for learning the initial steps in loving and caring for another person. But there's no need to stop there. There's no need to stop that. that. And if we see part of the role of that relationship is for each of us to learn to love more fully and more widely, and not as an exclusive thing. And that will naturally include not doing things that will unnecessarily harm the current relationship we're in. In fact, it will deepen our value for that relationship if we approach it in healthy ways. Usually what spiritual teachers express is essentially a love for all of humanity. It's very inclusive and very outreaching. And that's what they're trying to lead us towards. That, in a sense, is what our own inner guide is trying to lead us towards. Each step comes to us when we're ready, and it's a natural evolution. And perhaps that is the natural evolution of humanity, is that we learn to love more and more of each other and create a world and a society that's based on that love. Romantic love, and the way we tend to idealise that person and be able to see the best in them, is very good practice. It's good training to then go on and be able to see the best in other people and the best in more people and be able to learn to connect with them and look for ways we can help them. As we do that, as we gain in our capacity to love and to help other people, then we begin to move into a more loving state in our daily life. Our thinking and feeling tends to revolve around that loving state. Just like when we have a romantic obsession with somebody, our time and attention and our thoughts and feelings going to how adorable they are, that's wonderful training for then the next step, for being able to give time and attention to other people we love and our people we care about 
and maybe even a growing love for wider society or for nature, our sense and capacity to love grows and expands. So romantic love is yet again is helping us to awaken to that wider capacity to love. But it in itself is not the ultimate goal. Oh,